CataractCoach.com podcast series, episode number 72 with Dr. Abba Amin, complex anterior segment surgery and trauma. Welcome back to our Cataract Coach podcast. Today I have a very special guest, the master of the complex anterior segment surgery, Dr. Abba Amin. I met her when she gave a lecture on the podium. She presented the craziest anterior segment reconstructive cases, trauma cases, ruptured globes, I learned so much. So I said, I've got to get her on the podcast so we can all learn together. So welcome. Thank you, Ude. This is now great. Tell us, your, tell us your path on ophthalmology because I know you had two fellowships done. You had the buy one, get one free plan for that. <laughs> and then how'd you end up being such an incredible surgeon at complex anterior segment, trauma case, et cetera? You know, it's kind of funny when I look back uh, you're right. I did the fellowship. I finished school very early. I did one fellowship. I did the second fellowship. Tell me about your fellowships. What'd you do? I and did where? at glaucoma uh, at Mass Ioneer first, and uh, that was great. And then uh, cornea refractive was up and coming. LASIK was very hot at the time, and so I did the second fellowship in cornea and refractive at New York Ioneer. And then I stayed in Manhattan because my parents are from Long Island, and Manhattan is great. And I lived there for like ten years. I was in academic uh, medicine for at New York Ioneer. I just stayed there teaching their residents. I did all kinds of crazy cases. I used they used to call me the commando because I would do the glaucoma and the cornea, put the tube, do the graft, and reconstruct the eye. And it was all me at that time. So uh, I did quite a lot of uh, complex, interesting cases. Just because of my background, people would ask me. So I did that. <clears throat> And that's where it all started. But uh, then there was a long path of more normal cases of private practice, cataracts, and regular cases, transplants, tubes, but never the combined disaster dramas until I joined this final practice where now it's picked up again and then really taken off. And you're also still in academics. Now you're teaching medical students, you're involved with, tell us about all that, your academic involvement. Yeah, so when I was at New York Ioneer, I was teaching residents, precepting them, teaching them surgery. And then I took a little hiatus in private practice. And now I'm back in academic medicine at Westchester Medical Center, where I have residents and I actually am director of medical students. So it's like a different role. And it's, it's kind of a nice time in my career to, to teach them because they're so young and they just want to explore ophthalmology. And pretty much anyone who spends a day with me wants to go into ophthalmology. So like, um, they love it. I love it. And uh, there's just a different energy coming from medical students than than uh, different uh, residents and attendants. That's all. What's the energy? Just, I guess, the enthusiasm, the, the newness to it? I'll tell you a great story. Sure. So there was one medical student, Savannah. She's uh, She came to me, didn't know what she wanted to do. She followed me around for a little bit and did a couple projects with me in research. Very attentive did a great job. And, uh, you know, you don't realize the power or the influence you have over someone else until they just tell you, because you're just moving along in your day. They're coming along with you and you're just doing your thing. And uh, one day she said to me, she looks at me and she goes, Dr. Amin, you changed my life. And, and I was like, whoa, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> a tear came down my eye. And uh, that was my moment of realizing what impact I have on the younger generation of ophthalmologists coming up. And of course, she uh, applied and matched and all that. And we are still in touch. But uh, I just didn't realize until she said that, just like, and she said it so naturally because for her, it was an everyday experience. Wow. Now, are the med students of, let's say, today different than a couple decades ago, like when you and I were residents or medical students? I think so. In what way? What do you think? You know, they're, they are, the some of the ones that I see are kind of overachievers. Like they, they really try hard. They know how competitive the field is. They're writing papers, they're doing research, they're doing everything they can because they know how hard it is. Like, I don't know if I would get in now with what I see coming in. <laughs> I didn't, I don't think we did all that. And maybe we didn't have the means, we didn't have, we didn't have the internet set up. We didn't have all these connections or the coaching or the mentoring. It just wasn't a thing before. Yeah, I think you're right. It's certainly more competitive now. Yeah. Uh, if I look back, like just a medical student to apply to medical school, well, I basically applied at the nadir, the low point, the easiest point possible. It just happened to be with timing. 
Yeah. But I think back back then it was like 75% of people who applied to med school got in. I think that number now is like a third. I didn't even know 30, that. 30 or 40%. It's really low. It's like less than half. It's hard. Is, and yes. with this doctor shortage, it doesn't even make sense. But in my own experience, I went to a six-year med program. So I guess I got in even... I don't know if it was probably harder to get in, but it was such an early time and that was the trend at the time. And that's how I entered the field. But uh, yeah, med students, it's hard to get into med school. It's so hard to get into ophthalmology. We get like 500 applications for three spots. It's like insane. How do you screen? So like in the old, when I was involved with resident selection, which I stopped being involved two years ago, you know, we do some screening based on grades or OCAP, uh, uh, USMLE That's step cool. one scores. Well, there are no more grades in most med schools. And USMLE scores are now just only pass fail for step one. There's no number. How do you even differentiate anyone? You're absolutely right. It's very hard to differentiate. We have just pass fail. Obviously, if you fail, that's a, that's a no, red flag. But uh, the passing mm -hmm. people, I mean, you have your top students and your not so good students all passing. And so you can't use that anymore. Boards part two, you still get a score. So we do insist on boards part two, and that's a differentiator. So if you score high on that, you can show your academic strength. Uh, letters of recommendation, we should be calling all these people that send the letters to know that, you know, all the letters are positive. You can no call five, you can letter. call three letters per applicant, 500 hours, and you can call 1,500 people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're getting, you, you got the idea. It's very hard to do this. What we do is we divide the applications amongst the faculty. So okay. we divide like 500 by five or 10, depending on the year. And uh, we go through, you know, where they're coming from, their scores, their letters, their research. That's really all you get. But you do have boards part two. And we also, I run a medical student rotation. So I allow as many students who want to come, come rotate with us so we get to mm. know them in person because the interviews are virtual too. So this is the only hands-on we get on these students. So I think the more we let in, the more we get to know them. And uh, that seems to be working much better than just an electronic application. So would you encourage then like a young med student to go do other outside or away rotations so that other programs can get to know you? Absolutely. Audition rotation, 30 days. Yes. <laughs> okay, that's that's a very, yeah, very interesting. But the thing is, uh, you got to behave and you got to do well. Otherwise, you're going to be out. <laughs> right? Yeah. I don't you can understand. go to a program. If they don't like you, then they're not going to take you either. So the sword cuts both ways. Yeah, you got to do it both ways. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's a big challenge. So I don't, I, again, I, I don't know what the right answer is to choose the appropriate applicants. But certain things, you kind of have your hands tied. Like I said, there's no more grades, no more board scores. In fact, you know, there is a lot of failing. I'll tell you that now. There was a recent newspaper article about UCLA Med School, where I guess the new medical students have a really high fail rate on the basic shelf exams for like peds and med and OB and ER. So I guess it is changing times. But I think I like your advice of going there in person just to show that, hey, I've got a good, strong work ethic, et cetera. And, you know, even at one point we suggested, okay, why don't we try a, a dexterity test? Yes. Well, that's not allowed because that's against the American with Disabilities Act, apparently. Yes. You know what, though? We want to do that, too. And we had suggested it and some kind of suturing test or something. And I, what I do is I have my med students uh, scrub in with me and I watch mm -hmm. them and I have them cut my sutures. And that's a pretty good test of dexterity or coordination, if you say, if you will, uh, I do that and you know that's the only way to really know but you're right we should be able to test for that in our field but it's not allowed when i was uh, a medical student working with attendings and they wanted me to cut the sutures i'd always say would you like me to cut this one too long or too short <laughs> <laughs> you're right it's always like that. <laughs> you're never gonna do it perfect so you'd be a little too you're, you're absolutely you know, right when i look back i go that's a little too long a little too short <laughs> so, yeah, or, yeah. Oh my God! Don't do that again. <laughs> come in like. <laughs> and then you work with the residents too. That you're teaching them, basically the whole spectrum of anterior segment surgery. You're attending everything. Yeah, I mean they can come in on any case. I do a wide variety of cases, so I can do cornea, glaucoma. Uh, more recently, my practice has driven me toward anterior segment reconstruction, like Yamani or you know scleral fixated IOLs and. Uh, 
because we're a trauma center, we see a lot of tra traumatized eyes. So the cases are so unique. Like you can put a secondary IOL, you can do an irido uh, dialysis repair. So I, I feel like I got such a fun, creative job all of a sudden. The eye comes and I get to put it back together. The last case I did with the residents was uh, had a traumatized cataract surgery, okay? Traumatic cataract surgery. So I got to do uh, Yamani and I got to do the sewing machine technique to put the iris back on. And Oh, wow. Yeah, it was really a nice combination. And I, I just enjoy the, the thinking, the planning and the uh, execution of these plans. <laughs> So since you have a lot of trauma coming into, probably the most common trauma, what I was teaching you as we saw for, for, for the eye was, you know, let's say corneal laceration that extends inside the eye, maybe hits the iris and, and nicks the anterior lens capsule. Oh, yeah. Kind of your stepwise approach to this. Do you always remove the, 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 the uh, crystalline lens at the time of? Do you ever put an eye well in or is the eye too dirty? You have to wait, come back. What's your kind of approach to that kind of case? So we could take it one a step at a time. The corneal laceration obviously has to get closed. The iris repair, that always takes a back seat. You sure. have to, if there's anything extruded, you kind of have to excise it. If you can save it, you can redeposit it. The lens is the tricky thing. You're right. It, it depends. Like how big was the cut? If it was a tiny perforation, like just a nick, and you don't have obvious fluffy white material in the AC and the pressure's okay, you might be able to hold on to that patient, get a good measurement and do a lens calc and come back if you think you can save it in the rexus. But uh, once the capsule is so violated that you're gonna have pressure spike or spilling of protein, right. I think you gotta get the lens material out. Uh, in our institution, we don't have measurements that we don't have a way to calculate from the ER. These people would be admitted. So I would just remove the lens material at the time if I needed to, let the eye quiet down and go back another day when they're quiet get the lens calc and just the secondary eye well can wait. Right. Yeah. Well, that, makes, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, what we, were, what we did actually, would we, we'd measure the other eye. Yeah, we, that's had a, we had a little portable A scan, so you could do application A scan of the OR even. And then we had a handheld keratometer. So you could do reasonable calcs of the other eye, err on the side of just a pinch of myopia or so. Yeah. And it's funny how a lot of these came out to be about 22. 22 doctors seem like- 22 is seat. my number two, right? If I have to guess, but you're absolutely right. And we have been looking for a handheld keratometer for a long time. So maybe offline, I'm gonna ask for your model, lens model that you guys had that- uh, Oh, it was, it was an older one made by NIDEC, battery powered handheld keratometer. Okay. N NIDEC we, we need to get one Because we, we have a lot of things like this and it's very hard to, to do that on the fly. Yeah, it's actually, it was actually re reasonably reliable and, and, and accurate. So something you can definitely look into there. Yeah. So, it's, it's, so then, yeah, I, I get your idea of coming back. Sometimes we just do the eye all the same time if we thought the wound was clean enough or yeah. pretty clean. But I guess you're right. I mean, the error on the, on the part of uh, safety would be don't put any hardware in the eye. Well, also, like you have your corneal lac and the sutures and the measurements and all that. And also remember these cases are going either late at night or very early in the morning. It's mm. sudden, you don't have much time to plan. It just happens. Like so we try to get our ruptured globe cases in within six hours, like into the oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, so that's another thing. It's a time factor. You're gonna suddenly get a phone call. You know, your world stops. You're the attending on call. You get that call, like ruptured globe. They're like, okay, okay. Rearrange everything we're doing figure out this and you're after that OR, They're like get me in, get me in, get me in. I need a time, I need a place. And then then you're gonna work with whoever's on call, on staff. And so it's just not set up for IOLs. It's just, that's like a premium. That's like icing on the cupcake. We're right. gonna close this ruptured globe. We're gonna stabilize the eye, prevent infection, control whatever is the emergency and then uh, and then take it from there. That's kind of how, cause we, we see one or two of these a week. So, oh wow, you're busy. Yeah, <laughs> one or two a week. So, I mean, not me personally, but whoever's on call. But uh, yeah, so that's why whenever I do any work on the house or my car, I always wear the safety glasses because I don't want to be that one Dumbo ophthalmologist who didn't heed his own advice. <laughs> that 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 scares me too. And when we have people working in the house, I give them safety glasses. I said, "You need to wear this. This can't happen in my house." <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you know, I don't want to go to work today. It's, it's the weekend. I don't want to come. Don't you be calling me, and I'm driving you to the ER. 
<laughs> but yeah, I think uh, eye safety summer, it's 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 so it's so important. Yeah. Another one we would see commonly. And I'll get your input on this one as well. Trauma causing, like I say, eight ball high fema. How long do you wait it out? What point do you say I'm going to go in and evacuate thy fema? Because we tended to just after a couple of weeks we just go evacuate thy fema. Yeah, so we I can think of a case exactly just like this that happened. There was a guy who had an eight ball high fema. We're watching it. We're watching it. We're waiting for the corneal staining. The pressure's climbing 50, 60. We don't have a choice. If the pressure's high, you got to go in. So I, I was one of the people that evacuated it and uh, evacuated it. And then, the, of course, the next day he rebleeds. Mm -hmm. Somebody else evacuates it and, it and it just rebleeds. So at that point, we left it alone because there was no point in taking this guy again and again and he would replete. I don't remember why this was happening. Uh, if he had neovascular glaucoma or he had, uh, I forgot what the story was, but sometimes you go in and then they just replete. So you, there's no winning sometimes, but uh, if right. the pressure is high, you pretty much have to. Well, what's your approach? So we would always go in 23 gauge bimanual of a tractor. Oh, I see. So it's easier to wash out the AC. Plus, if there's a big clot, that I can use the retractor to kind of chomp it out and suck it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I, I, I like the anterior retractomy for multiple reasons. I mean, that's a great idea. And you have small wounds and you can just do this. And then I think for that case, I left viscoelastic in just to kind of hold the space so the blood couldn't mm. get in to, to protect mm. the cornea a little bit. But, uh, you know, then you have your pressure problem. Right. right. We were trying to save the cornea from blood staining. Oh, I remember the story. Tell it me. Was Halloween, the guy was out and someone shot him near the eye with something. So they hit him with something on Halloween. The guy was just sitting outside. That was the story. Yeah. And uh, he got a hyphema from it. Yes. Isn't it always funny? The people, it's always like Saturday night, early Sunday morning, 2 a.m. While I was just walking down the street, minding my own business. And then... <laughs> right. <laughs> right. This guy is like an adult and 60 something and he was uh, out on Halloween. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 <laughs> but no, obviously these can be, these can be very tough cases here. Now tell me about the importance of getting it done right away. So you were, you were saying we talked uh, at a dinner and you said you had a patient who came in bad case and then lost, never came back for the surgery. You know, this is where money comes in. If people have insurance, they can stay and feel comfortable. They get afraid if they're going to get a bill. They, I mean, these hospital bills, I can't even imagine what it comes out to. Somehow, and I wasn't there, so I don't know, but he got spoofed by the potential of getting a bill. And therefore didn't have the surgery. He, yeah, he left. He just didn't. Uh, it's sad. I, I have to follow up on that and see what happened. Hopefully he came back. Uh, our hospital actually is very good about this. They would have, they would have, you know, of course they would have done the surgery and they have something called charity care. And yeah. so, but uh, I don't know what the understanding was for that patient, but he got spoofed by the idea of a bill. Right. When I was with the residents of the county hospital here in LA, what we do also is, you just do as, as much as you can in the one sitting. So a patient came in and say, with bad near vascular glaucoma, well, <laughs> obviously you're going to inject the anti-VEGF, but when you go to the OR, patient 60 plus, the lens isn't totally clear, let's take the lens out. Yes. While he's a fake kick or she's a fake kick, put the indirect, uh, indirect laser on, do 2,000, 3,000 shots of PRP, then put the eye well and then put the Ahmed valve in, boom, everything in one sitting. That's great, that's great. That's so nice that you could do that. I mean, uh, and that's what they need until they come back yeah. for the ride. <laughs> right. I mean, if you if you had better follow up, let's say those patients were in your private thing, you may do it in a stepwise approach. Yeah, yeah. But, but he, yeah, you, just kind of thing, you have to do as much as you can. You're right. You're absolutely right. And this guy needed a lot, and he got spoofed. Oh, that's too bad. It makes it very challenging. Now, the other thing you do besides all these trauma cases, which I always have a keen interest in trauma. Is you do very complex reops, reoperation, reconstruction. Now, I do. Um, it's it's actually kind of interesting. So a lady just came in yesterday. Okay. Bilateral uh, dislocated lenses, you know. And I was like, uh, I called my partner and just to take a look, you know. And he, yeah. he comes in, he sits down, he's like, okay, I gotta look. And all of a sudden, you see his eyebrows go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yep, I thought so. <laughs> So the whole the bag plus Iowa complex dislocated both eyes. No, this was the natural lenses. So she was oh, like in lenses. her forties. Yeah, she had bilateral and dislocated cataracts. So she has no workup for Marfans or anything. So we got to start all that. 
Uh, she she must have a very high axial length. She's um, essentially a phakic in the right eye because the lens is so dislocated out of the visual axis and her refractive error was a plus 14 in that eye. Uh, the other right. eye is a minus 10. Yeah. Such a complicated situation. So the left eye is a minus 10 with glasses. She's 2100, but that lens, you can see the edge, the edge is crossing the pupil. Mm. Uh, we've just started the workup now, so she has to come back for axial length and all that and figure it out. And she's going to need to combine like vitrectomy, lensectomy, and scleral fixated lens. And hopefully she'll be a happy camper and move on from that. But it's pretty interesting. And uh, we're going to do the workup and see why she has this. Now, what would be your approach to that case? Let's say in two situations. One, her one eye where it's so dislocated, she's essentially aphagic. And yeah. the other where it's only partially dislocated and you can still see it in the in the pupil. Yeah, so yeah, it'd be kind of interesting to be able to go save that capsule. Like we're talking, so the right eye, the one that's um, out of the visual axis is a densely amblyopic eye. So that eye's not going to get work done, basically. She's amblyopic despite refraction and all that. So uh, maybe a second, you know, as a second case. But the primary eye, uh, you can think about saving the bag, but it's very hard to move that lens back into place. You'd have to, you'd have to go in, do the rexus, put capsule hooks, pull this capsule back to the middle. The cataract could come out. It's a little bit dense, but it could come out. And then you would put an Ahmed segment, suture it to the sclera, bring the bag back to the middle, then put your viscoelastic, your IOL, and close. Mm -hmm. uh, capsule tension ring probably too. So you kind of hook the whole situation back to the center, and that would be your, quote, ideal fix. A lot of work, a lot of time. Uh, I'm considering that as one option. The other option is, PPL, PPV, and then scleral fixated IOL, like the Yamani technique. Is there, because in a case like that, I'd expect you need to have two points of suture fixation. So two segments, two Ahmed segments. Yeah. Or yeah. the double Sioni ring. But in no, case, you're right. It's a it lot of work. Sense? Does it make sense to even save the bag? Why? Why save the no. bag? So the, the first time I tried to do this, I realized I was like, I'm not doing this again. <laughs> I did this exact scenario. Uh, I don't know why, but it was a mature cataract that was dislocated traumatic. Mm -hmm. And I went through the whole thing. I brought the thing to the center. I did the cataract removal. I put the IOL in. And then I realized the zanules were shot on the other side too. But um, I had a capsule tension ring in and one Ahmed segment. And it, it held because of the ring. So it was like solid. We don't have the Sionis uh, yet at the hospital. So, But you're right. It's too much work to do two Ahmed segments and a ring. Too much work so yeah. this time we will recommend ppl ppv sfio yeah yeah especially the nice part too sometimes you don't realize a mistake i've made in the past you look at a patient at the slow lamb you say well the, the lens is the, the character's only a little bit decent not too bad but then you get them on the or table and they're fine <laughs> and then gravity kicks in and that le that crystalline lens is solidly yeah. in the mid vitreous yeah 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 no i'm this case is going to sit i'm going to sit with retina for this case there's just no reason to not do it this way. I think I've learned my lesson the hard way about that uh, Ahmed yeah. segment and all that time. It was a long case. I mean, it was very satisfying to go through the motion of it, but uh, I don't need to keep doing that to save a bag. Uh, right. Yeah. Right, right. No, for sure. Like I say, share the love and the liability with the retina team. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's, but and I think that's honestly going to serve the patient the best, especially if you're suspecting very long axial lengths, younger patient. Absolutely. You know, do yes. the full vitrectomy, lensectomy, take your time. Now, give us a, some good trips, tips and tricks here for your mind. Now, there have been some controversy recently. People said, well, I, I, they shy away from the CT to C anymore. Now they're doing the AR40 from AMO instead or J&J &J instead. Yeah. What, what, what are your kind of pearls? What lens do you like for, for Yamane? So I, you know, I self-taught Yamane. Obviously, we all did. And I learned on CT Lucia, just like uh, that was the lens to go to. And it was a wonderful lens. It was really so nice. And I had some great results with CT Lucia until that rotisserie effect started. And it Tell us about to that. Me. For those who don't know, tell us about the rotisserie effect. So basically, the haptic optic junction is not solid. It was They changed a little bit of the technique of how they were making the lenses, but... Uh, I don't know if everybody, I don't know if we really know why it's happening, but basically the optic and the haptic where it's glued in, the glue becomes soft or the glue doesn't hold anymore once it's in the aqueous and then the rotation can happen. So instead yeah. of being flat, 
you become at 90 degrees. And uh, my first experience was with this was in the OR. I was doing a case, oh, such a complicated case. Um, had a ruptured globe repair by somebody else many years ago, had an IOL kind of hanging on partial capsule, probably lost his lens, you know, in that kind of case, like we we're talking about earlier. And then the lens dislocated, you know, it moved out of position. It was a partial capsule or tear. So the case was uh, remove the IOL and put a new IOL, but he had a bad cornea. So he needed a DSEC. So, and he needed a vitrectomy. So <laughs> it's very complicated. So we did the removal of the IOL and the vitrectomy together, came back another day and had to do the DSEC. Okay. And uh, wait a second, hold on. Uh, maybe I'm even mixing up the order, but the bottom line is, is that the guy had a DSEC that was working and he needed an IOL. Okay. okay. So I went to do the secondary IOL and I did the whole thing. I was very happy with it. And I put in the myocol, I closed my wounds, like corneal wounds, and then the IOL flipped. I was oh, like, wow. Wait a minute. I thought I was done. I was done. I put in my myocol, I closed my wounds and the IOL was 90 degrees in the iris. It wasn't flat anymore. Like I left it. I never would have put the myocol if it wasn't that way. So it flipped mid end case and I'm um, going in with instruments, trying to flip it back, flip it back. Right. This is not happening. What, what's going on here? And then I'm like, oh, the realization happens. You're going to fix this now or you're gonna come back twice because the d is right. gonna swell. Right, well, right. I won't get a view. So I was like, all right, everybody bring the iris hooks. <laughs> Let's get back to school. Well, I'll tell you these cases, they could take a week off your life. <laughs> I bring in the hooks, open it up, look at this thing, like flipping it some more because I'm in denial. I had just flanged this thing and covered the conge, open everything up take off the flanges, pull out, cut the IOL out, bring me another CT Lucia. <laughs> oh, God. And I did it again. Yeah. And that was held. But uh, whoa, what a lesson. After right. that, I did a lot of research about this rotisserie. It wasn't, it was still early on uh, when the rotisserie effect, mm -hmm. I guess I was one of the early first 10 or 15 people to experience it. So they were looking for lens models and ex everybody was talking about it and what happened. And I said, I don't know. You know, this is what happened. And it happened to me a second time. Uh, and it was another lady who had suit exfoliation, a fake egg, needed a Yamani case. And she flipped day one. I said, she was count fingers in her vision day one. And I said, why is that? You know, usually people see pretty well. I look in there and it's facing me at 90 degrees. Mm. And I was like, wow. And then you have to take a deep breath and have that conversation with the patient. Like, we have to take this out. And I put a, I did a scleral fixated MX60E after that, actually, because I, I couldn't even bear the thought of doing Yamani, I mean, a CT Lucia again at that time. Yeah, most surgeons I talked to have kind of shied away from that lens now and doing uh, using other three-piece designs. So now I'm using AR40, just yeah. like we were talking about. And you just have to be very gentle. The haptic is very brittle. It's broken on me, too, on the, on the second trailing haptic. And then you're like, deep breath. I'm going to have to take this thing out and do it again. So there's a lot of uh, AC acrobatics going on here. <laughs> no, for, for sure. I mean, if you want, if, if listeners or viewers want to hear the, see the video, we, if you go to cataractcoach.com, type in rotisserie, we have a video of this. <laughs> and then also some surgeons are using, for a loose haptic optic junction, using the, um, the argon laser. The yeah, I don't do that. Laser, and then doing some shots into the laser to help kind of glue, you know, meld the two together. Yeah, I mean, that's beyond my uh, scope, but uh, I think I just switched lenses and I've having pretty good results with that AR40. And uh, the more I do it, I'm getting more comfortable with the brittle haptics and the tight fit with the needle. So I've converted. <laughs> I, I sometimes wish we had lenses that they have in the rest of the world, like they have iris clip lenses for aphakia. So for plus sure. our lenses that you can clip to the back surface, the posterior surface of the iris. We obviously just don't have them here. So what are the sense. other options you'll do here? So are you shying away from AC lenses completely? You've written them off? Would you, is this, you going to do Yomane? Would you ever do like a Gore-Tex to the sclera? What are your other options? So Gore-Tex is an option and I did experiment with Gore-Tex early on and it just didn't work well for me. I guess I had one or two bad experiences with the uh, fenestration hole uh, fracturing and the MX-60E mm. when I guess 
you know, when you're doing these cases, you want to make everything tight. You want to make sure, and you, you probably over, I probably over tighten the suture. You can cheese wire through the acrylic. Cheese material. wire through the fenestration hole because I put it in, I buried the holes, and then there's a lot of hypotony in the first few days because all these holes are big, okay? Mm -hmm. When you're putting those MST forceps through sclera, those are big holes. And so you get a little hypotony, a little optic capture with the iris, and finally one day it fenestrated through and the retina guy had to go in and take everything out and I put all that effort in. So I stopped Gore-Tex after that and I started experimenting with proline. And uh, after I had this uh, rotisserie effect, I started suturing a lot of MX60Es with uh, proline and flanging. I became obsessed with flanges. So so what size proline? So I, I do seven of proline. I know a lot of people do six and it started with six. I like seven. It's a little, it's a little finer. It's a little more bendy and uh, it flanges just enough. It's fine. It's flanges enough to uh, not go back through the sclera. So you'll tie, an, uh, you'll tie a, a knot through the eyelet and then flange or you're going to flange both ends? No, it's two ends and I'll flange around. So it's two ends, like a, the lasso, like a C-loop. Oh, got it, got it. So, so it goes one needle goes in, goes under the hole and back above. And I use the other side. I don't use the side that usually fractures. The, the classical, the classic Gore-Tex technique is to go through the other side. There's like, the flange is like this and the haptics like this. And so there's a weaker side and there's a stronger side. So I hook the stronger side. Okay, so I, oh, I get it. So the, 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 you, you hook around the side that has the big haptic on. Yes, exactly. I hook that side. I don't hook the inner side. The Gore-Tex technique, yeah. Does a triangle like three point fixation, uh, two point fixation, but through that smaller, the weaker side, and I, that's the one that fractures. I think. Oh, that makes a lot. Of, yeah, because the 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 side of the of the eyelet that it's up against the thick haptic is a strong. thicker piece of acrylic. Yeah, it's strong. The, and I don't get tilt because I'm on the outside of all this. I'm not on the inside where you have to make sure. I don't know if you've done this, but that Gore-Tex is so tricky. You have to be under and over. It's like, if you get it wrong, and I've gotten it wrong before, that IOL goes like yes. this. <laughs> yeah, you get a twist. Yeah, no, for <laughs> sure. Small pupil, you don't know where it's twisted. You're like in a stress. <laughs> so I stopped all that. <laughs> so, but with this technique, with that MX60, you're doing, I guess, there are four flanges then. So each each suture, each eyelet has a C-loop suture yes. and two flanges then. Yes, it does, yeah. Now, are you seeing any late erosion of these? Because I've seen some patients who had... Yamane or other some kind of kind of Brava type techniques. And then they have these big, huge flanges that are just <laughs> not buried within the sclera. They're just sitting under the conge and that just eventually erodes right through. Yeah, you know, you might be right. And I'm just waiting for that day, knock on wood. It hasn't happened yet. I'm also super compulsive about the tension. I spend probably more time adjusting the tension than it takes me to hook the lens. I make sure I don't have extra slack. I think that happens because Imagine you can't see what's behind the sclera and you have a lot of slack. I think the slack eventually comes up and that's what pushes the thing out. If it's a tight fit, it shouldn't extrude, right? It should be held back by the IOL, like a little bit of a hangback. So if you have too much slack, <clears throat> I think that <clears throat> gives the potential for it to extrude. The other mm -hmm. thing is I do try to bury it in the episclera. And more recently, I've been creating a scleral groove before I put the needle holes in. Oh, that makes sense. So then I can quickly tuck it under and then it's pretty solid. Uh, so by adjusting the slack and then doing a little berry, I think would be okay. In fact, I finally saw some of my one year post-ops. I mean, I haven't been doing this very long and they're pretty well buried. The Tenon's got pretty thick over it, but I do keep a close watch. And that's the first thing I look at is the flanges. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, I'm waiting for the day. I'm sure, I'm sure somebody's gonna extrude and we'll have to go in and take out the slack or make an adjustment or put a patch graft over or something. Yeah, patch graft, that sounds pretty easy. I yeah, guess. Right. but I think it's gonna be because I left slack. I, I bet it's gonna be because I have too much suture that I can't see. And therefore it just kind of, it lifts up and lifts. tends up the conch over time. And I think so, because if it was a tight fit, how could it how could it come up, you know? So let's say you have an ophthalmologist in the community who hasn't done these and wants to learn it because Obviously, I didn't learn this in residency. It didn't exist 20 years ago. Same here. So we, we taught ourselves. So how do you, what advice do you give to the ophthalmologist to, to get the foot into this kind of field? And I want to try this. I have a patient who needs this. How do I approach it? How do I teach myself this? Besides watching a ton of cataract coach videos. <laughs> and I did. I've watched your videos. They're fantastic. 
Um, I do learn by watching other surgeons who've done this before me, and I learn a lot from that. But I think you need a basic skill set first. You can't just watch and do something totally new. If you're just doing cataract surgery, you can't just watch Yamani and do it. No way. So you need to watch, you need to hover, you need to maybe watch someone else in the OR do it. Mm -hmm. The other thing I did was I used to practice in a wet lab. I had the model eyes and I actually mm -hmm. Yamani a lot of model eyes, not a lot, maybe five or 10, you know, something like this. You just keep redoing it. It doesn't take long once you're set up. You get that motion. Uh, nothing is gonna be like real life, but at least you get the muscle memory of how to pass the needles, how it looks. And I'll tell you a little pearl that I got from doing this. All right, so model eye, when you do the Yamani, you get it in there, it looks good from the front. What I did was you open the model eye and you look at the IOL from the inside, because this is the view you'll never get in real life. And you mm. really see like, where are you? Where are you with these needles? Where is this haptic? Is it in the sclera? Is it through the ciliary body? You just get a lot of mental uh, picture of where it's gonna be. So I think that helps in the OR. If you kind of know the anatomy, the unseen anatomy and where you're going with these needles, right. it just helps, I think. And that's how you can be creative on a long eye versus a short eye. You, know, you modify your numbers a little bit, right? Because the anatomy is a little different. So I think the model eye was really enlightening for me once I opened it and looked inside, like what does the Yamani look like from that other view? <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's, that's, that's like that Miyaki apple yes. view that we never uh, get to see. We don't get to see it, right? I always wonder like, am I through the ciliary body? Am I above it? Am I below it? I'm, you don't know where you are. When you What's the it? other thing with these? You kind of don't know the, the final resting position of the eyewall optic. <clears throat> and to me, they always seem a little more posterior than I thought. So I'm always I'm always trying to add a little bit to the eyewall power. Like, uh, you know, if I need a 20 adopter eyewall for Plano for, quote, in the bag, uh, maybe 20 and a half, maybe even 21. Just so to you make think sure. you're A minus, right? A little bit, yeah. Yes, I'm even about a minus 75. <clears throat> right, similar. So I maybe adding a diopter to the eyewall power will leave them about minus 0.7-ish. So that same goes. It's a little bit of a crapshoot because at this point, when they're getting Imani, they've got other problems. So, like. You know, but usually it works out pretty well. I'm I'm so shocked at how well people do with this procedure. Like right. they see well, their quiet eyes. It's really a testament to Dr. Yamane. You know, like what an amazing concept and idea that he came up with. Now, one of the challenges is for an anterior segment surgeon like me does this Yamane type technique. Oftentimes, we don't do enough of an anterior vitrectomy. Yeah. And so you'll see, I mean, now studies have shown that it's a pretty high rate of chronic macular edema, probably due to vitreous traction. Yeah. Some some of my videos I watch, and you'll see the acrobatics, and some of those haptics are solidly in the mid vitreous. And I just know you're you're entangling it up with the with vitreous. Yes. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Absolutely right. I mean, you know it when you're putting that first needle in and you let that lens go back. It's coming right. back to some vitreous. You know it. Uh, I do the vitrectomy from the PARS. I taught myself that. It was, um, I sat with the retina surgeon for a little bit. I said, let me put your ports in for you. Watch me do this. Coach me. I'm going to close them. I always close the holes. I don't do suture yeah. uh, But he and I sat through many, and then I, he's like, left me on my own. It's good. And so I'm comfortable. I know what to do. I do the vitrectomy. But, you know, I, I stay in my zone. I'll do the anterior vitrectomy from behind. And I'm a little compulsive about this too. I'll clean it up before, I'll clean it up after. I mm. clean it up in the front again. I use the Kenalog, the diluted Kenalog to make sure. Of course, you know, there's only so much you can do. I mean, you're kind of right. putting I mean, if you think about it, it could be vitreous traction, but it could be poking right through the ciliary body with these haptics. Wouldn't that cause CME? Yeah. I, I, I would all think the above. <laughs> yeah. So if they're getting 2040, some of these eyes, you know, the way they start, I mean, I, it's hard to know, right? What causes CME? I mean, there's a lot going on in these eyes. So some of my viewers will be a little disappointed to know that for a lot of these cases, I just refer them to a great vitretinal colleague. They do it the who, whole thing. Who was my, who was my resident before. It was an amazing resident. Obviously went into retina. He's a fantastic retina surgeon. Does a ton of these here in L.A., I'll tell him what eye will power I want to ensure the patient ends up myopic. Okay. And so he, he'll he do the full full part plan of attractomy, put the lens in, very secure. Patient, I'll see the patient three months later where the patient's minus one, minus 75 at 90, and I'll do LASIK for that and give wow. him 
bang on Plano. <laughs> That's and pretty then, nice. Yeah, for me, it's an easier way of meeting expectations of the patient because the patient wants to go back to sharp acuity. Yeah. Uncorrected acuity. And I don't think there's a way of really being that predictable with Yamane or even Gore-Tex IWA fixation. So I think that's why I just make sure the patient ends up myopic because then I can clean up with a little bit of myopia is easy to clean up with eczema laser plus any negative sill, easy ablation. I just don't want them to end up, you know, plus one, minus two at axis because that's mixed sill. And I got to steepen one bridge with a laser, flatten the other, and it's all kind of ugly, especially in the middle. So I'd rather be all myopic. You mean you can't ablate IOL tilt? Yeah, then if it's a lot of silk, <laughs> you know. But you know, a little bit, yeah. I mean, you get them happy in a refraction. Yeah. These are really small treatments. And then those patients do really, really oh, well. Oh, no, that's really amazing. Happy. You know, I never really thought about it. We don't have eczema access at, at our practice. Mm. So I guess it just never occurred to me that you're right. They absolutely could do that. And would you do a surface ablation, not a LASIK, right? You can do either. I don't mind doing LASIK. You have a femto. You don't want to put compression on this uh, eye, I guess. Yeah, but the new femto flaps. Yeah. Uh, it, it, you don't increase the IOP. Okay. The new femto flaps usually have a suction ring right around the limbus or edge of the cornea even. Okay. And the IOP is only going up, let's say, 20-ish, 20-ish, okay. 20s. So it's not like the old days of a mechanical micaretome where the IOP goes to 80 or 100. Yeah, that's what I'm remembering, yeah. And yeah, that no, I'm put so on yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you could also do that, too. You could also do a PRK, but it's just maybe a little less predictable doing a service ablation there. Okay. Now, speaking of all this, how do you set appropriate patient expectations for either a trauma case or this re-op case? So one of the hardest things I have to figure out is how do I convince the patient? Patients always think this is re-op is going to give them perfect vision. Like, my vision's terrible now. You're going to fix it. You're going to make it perfect, right, Doc? I'm like, yeah. eee, not so fast. No, How do I set those expectations? I, I set expectations. I give it to them very strange. Uh, like the lady who came yesterday, she's okay. like, oh, you're going to just do cataract surgery on me, right? The lady with the dislocated lenses? Yeah. I said, oh, no. I said, this is no standard cataract surgery. You're, you're, and she goes, well, okay, the cataract's gonna come out funny. I said, no, the retina doctor might, is gonna take out your cataract and I'm gonna put your lens in. And she says, oh, well, you're gonna put the lens in the standard way like everybody else, right? I said, oh no. <laughs> Just her expectation, she came in like, when I saw her in the chair, you had no idea that this was what's sitting in her eyes. Right. <laughs> she's like, you know, la di da. I'm just Dr. So and so referred me for cataract surgery. <laughs> so like, I looked in there and I'm like, oh, okay, you got bilateral dislocated lenses. So she's a conversation and a half. She's coming back another day, and I will pound a little bit more information into her uh, understanding. Like, so. The cataract comes out differently. The IOL goes in differently. The power is less predictable. So, and she only has one eye. She's essentially monocular. So, you know, she's got a lot of issues and I don't think she realizes. She just doesn't realize. Oh, I forgot to say she has an ectopic pupil. She was born with bilateral infranasal pupils. So she's going to need some kind of iridoplasty too, I guess, because the pupils are way off center. So I'm not really sure how this is going to end up. We're going to be getting pictures and uh, all that next time. <laughs> that'll be a great video for you to send for cataract. <laughs> yes, I, think I will. That okay. that'll, that'll be a very interesting one. But yeah, I think I liked your pearl of she's a conversation and a half. Bring her back a second time. So say everything once. Let it sink in. Let her think about it. Mull it over. Bring her back in a week or two or three and rediscuss it to kind of hammer home the points. That's so, I, I'm, not, I'm not that smart. I would have yeah. thought of that. I mean, you know, some people, some people are so complicated and sometimes I tell them flat out, I go, you have a big problem yeah. and I just met you and I need to think about you for a little bit. Oh, wow. I tell them that because people come with multiple layers of issues. I'll give you another example of who came in. A lot of my patients are pseudo exfoliation, uh, mm -hmm. IOLs that are subluxed because they're all 85, 90, 92. This guy was like 94, active, smart, runs, marathons, whatever, but his lens has been dropping. And so the mm -hmm. lens is below the visual axis. He's a fake kick. He got sent to me for refixation or IOL exchange. So I'm examining him and I see the IOLs dropped. That's pretty standard these days. And I see his pupil is peaked. I go, well, why is that? So I lift up his lid. It's very sunken. He's older. He's lost fat atrophy. I look, I go way under there. I go, there's an Ahmed valve in there. Go, oh my. Can you look really way down? 
and then the tube is extruded. So it's like, so my first thought is like, oh man, I see the tube, like the, you know, it's like exposed. The conjurer away at it. I was like, I wish I didn't look down there actually. Because <laughs> now yeah, everything tough. just got complicated because now, you know, you got to fix that and there's no space. It's a very tight orbit. And his lenses dropped. The only positive thing here was his pressure was controlled. So uh, I actually told him, I said, you know what? I got to think about this. <laughs> and I got to figure out what steps and how we're going to approach you. Because you need a vitrectomy. You need an IOL exchange. And you need this tube revised. Well, maybe um, remove if the tube is extruded. Maybe you don't, you well, don't need just, it anymore. Just the part that enters is extruded. You know, the tube. So he needs like a patch graft over it or something. But uh, it's just a lot of surgery on a 94-year-old. Uh, it's just oh. a lot. And uh, so just sometimes, or people just come up with multiple different issues like this. And uh, you're like, I have to think about you. We might be staging things. You know, do this now and do that later. And and so I do bring people back. One, they get to know me a little better. They get a little more comfortable. And you get to re-explain the, the risks, the benefits, and the alternatives, and the plan. Because these are complex scenarios right. and concepts. Right. So you're never going to teach them like we, we can understand. And they, they can't really understand what all this means. Right. They just have to understand that there's a problem. <laughs> no, that makes a ton of sense. I mean, the other thing, too, is that I didn't realize earlier in my career, which I, I've obviously figured out now, Nonagenarians, when you're 90 plus, that tissue is just not the same. 80 year old tissue versus like your patient, 94 year old tissue is a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I agree. The eyes were not meant to last this long, it seems. Like everybody I see in the 90s got big problems severe yeah, glaucoma, dislocated lenses. Yeah. It just seems like the eyes were not meant to last 90 years. Yeah. Like, in fact, early in cataract, which I got a video called Approach to the Nonagenarian Cataract, because it is just different. It's just like when you hit that age point, and I think we see it, you know, it's interesting we see is that we all know patients shift astigmatism, you know, from a little bit with the rule, when you get older, a little bit more against the rule. Right. And, you know, people, smart people like Doug Koch have taught us how to plan for that and maybe leave it just a tiny bit of with the rule so it shifts towards, towards neutral and then maybe later just a little bit of against the rule. And so... But we see patients somewhere in the hit 90-ish, these guys went from pre-spherical corneas to like two diopters against the rule, three diopters, and every year they get more and more against the rule. I mean, the tissues just can't hold up. Interesting. Yeah. You know, I guess like by the time they're coming to me when they're 90, they have so many other problems. I haven't <laughs> paid attention to the astigmatism. I'm like looking at the lens that's dropped, yeah. <laughs> the glaucoma, like the pressure is 60 or something else is going on. And... I will, I'm going to pay a little more attention to that, but uh, yeah, if they're 90 and they're coming to me, they got some big problems. Like, so. Right. Well, yeah, I have a very refractive mindset. And so yeah. your, your mindset obviously is actually on the disease process, all the cor corneal anterior segment disease, all the glaucoma disease, all the complicated, you know, eye related stuff. It's but I'm always thinking I, refractive. I for a small area in the body, there's the field is so wide. I know it's wild. It's wild. A friend of mine sent me a patient and I said, oh, you know what? I don't, that patient has a retina problem. I don't do retina. He says, wait a minute, you don't do the whole eyeball? I'm like, actually, no. He's like, how hard could it be? You got like two things the size of walnuts. And I'm like, you'd be surprised. It's probably not as easy as you think. Yes. Oh, I mean, we have to limit our practice. Otherwise, we would never finish. I mean, if you can't do everything, got to share. <laughs> you don't want to add that. You can do a third fellowship, add on a, a retina fellowship for a couple more years. You, you know, I wish I, I wish I did know, learn a little retina for my practice now. I didn't need it until now when all these things started. The patients that start coming need retractomy. But, uh, you know, I think it was a big jump for me to start entering the pars plana and yeah. doing the retractomy. But um, with, <clears throat> with the support of my retina colleagues, I think uh, it's been a nice transition. And uh, it's a much better way to remove vitreous than from the cornea. Right, because you're pulling it back down into the vitreous cavity. Yeah, and especially and the, when you're pushing the lens back into that space. Right. Yeah. So we, we have videos on cataract coach where when I would teach a resident, okay, you've got a, a ruptured capsule here and you got to do a vitrectomy. Let's just do a pars plane approach. Get infusion via the limbus and then and, and the vitrector cutter 
yeah. by the Pars Plana. So you get the proper flow. The vitreous goes back into the vitreous cavity. That's fantastic. If your residents are learning that from you, that's fantastic. I think well, not anymore. I, I retired two years ago. But I mean, I think it's nice for them to learn. I mean, I learned it so late in my career, but it, it's nice if they learn that technique now, so long as they're careful and they follow, you know, all the protocols. I think it's a good thing. Can you see yourself doing this type of practice, which is very busy, very intensely, you know, mentally stimulating, surgically challenging? Can you are you going to do it for the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years? Is this what you're doing forever? That, that's a good question. I was thinking about that myself. Um, so far, I've been doing it for five, six years. And it's okay. been great. And I'm still climbing my, um, I don't even know what to call this. Is it not a second education, but it's like a, it's like a, a shift in career. It's like exciting again to learn. Yeah. I'm still learning. I'm still getting better. So, but yeah, I don't know how long can I do this? I don't know, 10, 10 years, 12 years, you know, I don't, you say 30, 40. I don't think so. <laughs> well, I always, you know, I learned for me, I have to switch gears every so often. Yeah, so I taught sense, residents but... from the age of 30 when I was since I was 30 till I was 52. And that was enough. And now was I'm so two years ago, I, I, I stopped doing that. I was able to actually retire because uh, 52 was the earliest I could do the pension. <laughs> and so uh, I, took, I took it at 52. I'm like, see, I had enough. But I still do my private practice. And now I do more cataract coach stuff. I travel a ton. So I think we end up shifting gears or changing gears every so often. I think that's the right way to put it. I guess I shifted gears and I geared into a high, a high gear. Right. Intense. Um, I love it. And I get to share my videos and I'm going to send you some videos. And uh, there's a lot of excitement around complex cases. I guess people, other people find it stimulating too. If they're not doing it uh, in their daily practice, they like to see other people do it and watch how that happens. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you're right. I mean, there's a burnout period, right? I mean, if I keep doing this, I might get tired. I don't know. We'll have to check back in in a few years. Ah, uh, no, <laughs> I mean, it's obviously very intense stuff. But you're right. On the on cataract coach, some, some of the most popular videos are these complex anterior segment reconstruction videos. They really yeah, so are watching a thriller movie, <laughs> but it's not happening it, to you. <laughs> it, it is. It's because it's like it's interesting to see how you approach a very complicated problem. And then how you end up addressing it. Even if it's beyond my skill set, I still like to enjoy watching it. Yeah. I like to watch a complicated retina case. Yeah. And I don't do retina at all. Yeah. <clears throat> I can barely spell vitrectomy. <laughs> but I love to see them do these really in incredible maneuvers. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting. As I watch myself over time, my approach has changed to these complex cases. What I was doing three years ago is different how I would approach the similar case now. How it's so? amazing. Yeah, you know, we just learn from yourself. Like you try things a certain way because there is no book about how to fix these things. There's no protocol. There's no best practice for how to right. fix a dislocated lens. Each case is so unique, yet in the end, they have a certain pattern, you know, if you do enough. Sure. And, uh, right. Just like you would say, sometimes you want to do Yamani, sometimes you want to do suture fixation, sometimes. You know, and maybe I need to re-explore the ACIOLs like you asked earlier. I have not put an ACIOL in many, many years now. Uh, but I do have colleagues and friends who say ACIOLs are great. Depends on the patient, the age of the patient, situation. Mm -hmm. And not go through all this gymnastics and OR time. I mean, there's risk to, you know, time in the OR, especially for these non engineerians right? So Very true. Yeah. We have a lot of videos on Cataract Coach. Um, from resident cases where we taught all residents how to put an AC lens in, you know, meta analyses show that a well done ACIOL has the same performance, same risk, same complication rate as a very complicated scleral fixated IOL. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. I mean, I we used I used to put in ACIOLs a long time ago because we right. didn't have all these other options. Like if they didn't have a bag or if they were aphagic, they got an ACIOL. So. so I don't know. I mean, it's considered uncool to do it these days in, in from my, my setup, my type of practice. So I haven't done it, but uh, there's plenty of people who are doing it and getting good results. Yeah. I, if you want to do it, I'll defend you. I think it's a reasonable approach. <clears throat> On cataract coach, I have all the pearls of how to do it. <clears throat> never, oh, pardon me. Never enlarge your main incision, your coin incision to six millimeters to put it in. Make right. a scleral title. Make a scleral title. Yes, you're Use absolutely the right. PI. There's a video on Cataract Coach that asks, that teaches you what's the correct orientation. Never put it in upside down. 
<laughs> yeah, you even have a video that teaches you the proper way of doing the ACIO calculation. And no, it's not what your senior resident said, just subtract three diopters. That's not it. So I have which, an idea. Which lens model do you think is the best for ACIO? Well, the you... most popular in the US is going to be that, that Alcon the... MTA 3UO, yeah. 4UO, 5UO. And again, the, the four, three, four, five denotes the overall size of it in, yeah. in millimeters. And I even have a video of how to choose the right size. Yeah, no, I understand it, actually. We went over that with our residents too. So the a lot of the residents are so shy of putting an AC lens, they graduate without learning how to put one in because it depends no, which exactly. sending they're sitting with. So it's, it's kind of interesting. It's gonna become a lost art. We recently did a wet lab with the residents and I actually had them practice putting AC IOLs in model eyes just so nice. they could have the experience of extending a wound, holding the lens, figuring it out. But there was another model, a uh, Baojun Lam model, uh, it had a totally different look than the MTA, mm. Forto, which is what I'm used to. But uh, also very nice, very flexible, very small. I, mean, I just haven't had the personal experience. But right. No, I think I think it's a reasonable approach. Again, I have all these videos up there. Just, again, make a skill tunnel because these are PMA lenses, polymethyl in the faculty. You cannot bend them or fold them. They're rigid. Yeah, yeah, Make yeah. a skill tunnel, size it appropriately based on that, calculate it appropriately. Put it in appropriately, make sure the foot plates are nicely angle supported and not grabbing iris. Make a PI, you're done. So in a case, let's say that's aphagic and zero support, this is just such an easy option. What do you think about a foldable ACIOL if they could make one like that? If you could fold it, put it in, and then you get it in there. So you wouldn't even have to extend the wound. I bet people would be putting those in more often. I think it's the wound size and all the suturing and, and the prolapse and all that yeah. stuff that happens that makes people shy away. But what if you had an acrylic foldable IOL, AC IOL? How cool would maybe, that be? Maybe, maybe. They could make it. I don't know. It, it may need it may need though that rigidity to stay in the eye. That's the issue. Because the acrylic, a foldable one would be too soft. It wouldn't have the rigidity to kind of uh -huh. keep the vault or keep the or size. Or maybe you could be like a hybrid. The optic folds and the haptics for PMMA, and you could fold it to get it through a three millimeter. I don't yeah, know. No, you know, that's a good point. Because if you look back, you had like the 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 Vorsch lens, the the iris claw lens that yeah. was done, the varicise lens which was done for um, high myopia. That was an anterior iris clip lens. Yeah. And then they made the Veriflex, which is the same one that was foldable flexible. So yeah. Yeah, you're, you're right. There's a possibility for sure. The optic is just has to fold. The haptics can be what they want to be. I just think the, the companies will say, well, how many of these are we going to sell? I know. Right. Well, they should count how many AR40s they're selling. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll use like the AR40 for these ultra high myopes. That's like my oh, favorite lens. It, it, it comes true. in powers as low as minus 10. Really? Comes all, yeah, it comes all single. There's AR40E with a big E, AR40 little E, and AR40M. And M is the, the like even the minus powers. So you can have that lens anywhere from power of like plus 10, plus 9, all the way down to zero, then minus 1, minus 2, all the way up to minus 10. I did not know that. That's great. Yeah. All these high myopes. And then the other extreme is the highest plus power lens available that at least I can find in the U.S. Yeah. You can get an Alcon Acrosoft, the older, not the Claren, but the Acrosoft, up to plus 40. Wow. Right. I did put in a plus 35, and it, maybe it was probably the Alcon lens. But I haven't yeah, so, put in a plus 40. But I did put a plus 35 and a plus 36 in this one lady who got sent to me. It was like somebody sent her just because they didn't want to calculate that power. I was like, well, okay. it's, it's incredibly difficult to calculate. And it's a, that one's a little bit counterintuitive. The small eyes, a very, very long, short axial length with the shallow AC is easier to calculate. Yeah. It's a really shallow, a short eye with a, with a normal AC depth that's hard because then the eye well is closer to the retina and the power goes up dramatically. You may get eye well calculations of 40, 50, 60 diopters. It's so hard to know. I mean, yeah. it's the effective lens position. So I always tell these patients, I say, look, I'm going to do my best math for you. I'm going to calculate it. I'm going to have all the options for you. But in the end, you're going to have glasses, and there's no way to know exactly which way this is going to go. I mean, sure. and that's, they just have the expectation. I mean, I don't have LASIK backup, so this is it. This, And they're really very happy people, actually, when you fix this. Yeah, Look, I agree with you. My other pearl there is if it calculates out to more than 40 diopters, and I'm pretty sure the calculations, I'll just put in the 40. One yeah. lens. Let's see where you end up. Yeah. 
And then three months later, if you want, we can. If there's room, we can try piggyback. If oh. not, you went from a plus ten of hyperopia to plus two. You should thank me and not yes. complain. <laughs> they they will be happy. This lady I'm thinking about was so happy. She's bringing me chocolate, orchids, all kinds of gifts, and I'm like, I was off target, but. <laughs> She's so happy. I mean, it was very hard for me to predict those high numbers. And well, sometimes you can't have a second chance on the second eye. You learn from the first eye and you right. make the modification. You always do better on the second eye. And then it's a blended oh, sure. vision. Yeah. <laughs> well, I tell patients the result of your surgery is half of my surgery, half it's my surgery and my technique and my technology, but half is your anatomy and your heating. Yep. And that I can't really control. Yep. And That's so we'll see how that's up. Yeah. We'll go from and there. Now. <laughs> oh, fun stuff. Well, uh, but what a pleasure talking to you. I learned so much about these complex, challenging cases, reconstruction, trauma, setting patient expectations. Wow. Certainly, if anyone is in your neck of the woods, that's where you send the very complicated cases to. <laughs> Great. <laughs> but thank you again for doing the podcast. I, I really learned a lot, and I'd love to feature a video from you. Yes, for sure. And thank you so much for having me. This has been a wonderful podcast experience for me. All right. Thanks so much. And I want to remind our listeners and viewers, remember, I got a new podcast every single week on Sundays. And where you find your podcast, Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google, YouTube, anywhere. Plus, every day, a brand new Cataract Coach video, cataractcoach.com. We will check you next time.